Hello and welcome back to the Vol Report Show. I'm Ryan Sylvia with VolReport.com on the Rivals Network. And after a disappointing second half in Tuscaloosa that led to the Vols falling to Alabama, they hit the road again this weekend, heading to Lexington to play Kentucky. So no better time than now to talk with Justin Rowland of CatsIllustrated.com. To get to know what Kentucky looks like this year, Justin, first thing I want to ask you, I ask this to everyone that comes on the show, because I just think it's interesting to hear it from your perspective. What is kind of the vibe around the program right now in terms of the fan base? How do they see the team? And then the program, how satisfied are they with how the season has progressed to this point? Kentucky has kind of settled into a pattern where they kind of schedule their way to being undefeated against Florida and they tend to play well against Florida. And so what that does is it seems like every year Kentucky's 4-0, 5-0 coming out of the Florida game and fans believe that everything is possible. Everything's on the table. Now we play Georgia and this is for the East. And it's really, it's not that simple, obviously. It's kind of an illusion uh, that they they consistently build themselves up for this game against Georgia. And then this year it got torn down in a, in a big way. These last couple of games against Georgia and Missouri have been humbling losses for Kentucky against Georgia. They came out and, and they were bad from the start against Missouri. They started well, but once things went bad, they couldn't reverse it. And I maybe a little bit like Tennessee when Alabama came storming back. Um, and I think fans are disappointed but fans really get up for the Tennessee game and coming off a bye. That's the two competing threads right now. Disappointment with the losses against Georgia and Missouri, but also a realization that they've had two weeks to prepare for Tennessee and Tennessee fans know anytime Kentucky beats Tennessee, it doesn't happen often. That can define your season in a more positive way. So as you said, doesn't necessarily happen often. 80, 82, yeah. 26 and nine all time series. It's been very orange since the 80s. From the Kentucky perspective, though, what does that rivalry look like from kind of the Wildcats end of things? Well, there's obviously a lot of frustration. There's obviously a lot of anger. You know, the, when they played Missouri a couple of weeks ago, they got a taste of it the other way on a much smaller scale. They had beat Missouri seven out of eight and they saw the intensity of the loathing from Missouri towards Kentucky and Kentucky towards Tennessee is obviously orders of magnitude more. Um, mm-hmm. It has been more competitive in recent years and I okay. they, they won the, the game in the COVID year at, at Knoxville, but really the last three games at Kentucky have been really close. Kentucky won in 17 and Tennessee won close games in 19 and 21. So they're they're expecting, given the line and these recent meetings, that it'll be a close game in Lexington. Yeah, it feels like it's always uh, down to the wire whenever these yeah. teams play Lexington. Recently, I got to ask before we, we start to move to what this current team looks like, what are your thoughts on the beer barrel? Do you want to see it back? Or what are your thoughts on that whole tradition? Oh, yeah. I've been outspoken about this for a long time. I think it needs to come back. It's one of those cultural, Mm -hmm. iconic traditions in college football. It would be really cool, you know, when when the sport has lost so many rivalries and when so much is in turmoil and tumult, to bring something like that back would almost be like a a really cool vintage jersey. I mean, just something for fans to get excited about, and it encapsulates the, the nature of the rivalry well. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I think that would be a cool yeah. thing to, to see back. So Danny White, Tennessee's athletic director, has been uh, pretty good about kind of understanding what the fan base wants. Obviously not completely up to him, but uh, I think that if it's going to happen under anyone's watch, I, I think pretty soon it would make sense. Kentucky, though, coming off the bye week, when Tennessee had their bye week a couple of weeks ago, Hypo was saying this one came at the right time in terms of mentally resetting, in terms of getting healthy. Do you think this bye week came at the right time for Kentucky at this point in the season? Definitely. Well, I mean, if you get your bye in the middle of the season, that's good for obvious reasons. But given their losses to to Georgia and Missouri, I think they needed a hard reset. Uh, and the interesting thing is sometimes when they've come out of these hard resets, they've, they've tried to scale back the offense. Well, we tried to pass the ball. We tried to be a passing team. We tried to get balance. But now we're just going to play it close to the vest and we're going to run inside zone 40 times. And it's worked. It's helped them to, to move beyond the doldrums, the kind of the, the spiral. It stopped the bleeding. But this week, Stoop said that he seemed to imply that they're not going to do that, that they're still going to let it rip. They're still going to 
try to air the ball out because that's how they move forward as a program. They're not moving forward as a program if they're not if they're not doing what they want to do. So whether that works or not, we'll, we'll find out Saturday night. But I don't think it's going to be that um, ground and pound Benny Snell, Chris Rodriguez kind of offense that Tennessee fans have seen oftentimes. Yeah, the man that will be airing it out, Devin Leary, transfer. What have you thought from him so far? Going into the year, he was – kind of on my short list on guys that could make one of those all SEC teams and maybe hasn't lived up to that caliber yet. But what are your thoughts on how he's performed this year? There have been some disappointing aspects to his play. Some chip shots haven't been chip shots. He hasn't completed enough of a high enough percentage of his passes. There's been too many throws that you just don't understand what went wrong. A lot Mm -hmm. of times it's been after he's eluded pressure in the backfield and he hasn't set himself fully, or maybe he puts too much of his body into the throw but I think a big part of it is mental. His receivers have not helped him. I I haven't seen the updated stats, but as far as last week, they had the most drops or the highest drop rate in the country. So that's a lot of uh, yards, touchdowns, points left on the board. Um, And it has to mess with a quarterback's head when guys are consistently not getting open or they're not where they're supposed to be or they're dropping the football. So I place a lot more of the blame on the receivers as opposed to Devin Leary. And I actually thought Leary played well enough to beat Missouri. So, you know, coming back home, I think Leary is in a pretty good place. The question is, are the receivers good enough? Um, Because their mistakes haven't been small mistakes. They've been drop touchdown passes. They've been not contesting a 50-50 throw that leads to an interception. And they've got to be better. Another big point this offseason for Kentucky alongside bringing in Leary was bringing back offensive coordinator Liam Cohn what's the difference in this offense from last year this year with him back in charge and kind of what has he brought to the team you know it has it might not look a whole lot different but one thing that Cohen is really good at it I think he has a really good feel for play calling he's got a real he's really good at keeping a defense off balance and staying one step ahead of them in terms of personnel groupings and substitutions and really mixing things up. And if he really wants to showcase somebody and get them the ball, he's really good at doing that. Um, They're playing at a very slow tempo. They they run fewer plays per game than any other team in college football. And they've also been penalized too much. I know Tennessee has been penalized too much as well this year. But Kentucky, it seems like they've been playing behind the sticks the whole season. Way too many second and 14, second and 19 and they survived the first month against that week's schedule when that was the case. But we've seen against SEC competition, you just can't do that. And the dangerous thing this week is Tennessee's got a lot of sacks. They create a lot of havoc in the backfield. And you throw in the penalties and the mistakes. Is Kentucky going to be an efficient enough operation to, to exploit them on defense? I don't know. You, you mentioned that kind of aggression from Tennessee and how they're one of the better teams so far in the conference and getting after the quarterback. Do you think Kentucky's offensive line is prepared to deal with kind of the pressure they're going to be put under? They better be. It's it's not a group that has a lot of depth. They don't rotate a lot of guys. The starters have been an upgrade over last season. Last year, Kentucky and Boston College had the worst offensive lines at the Power 5 level. And this year, it's not that. They've only given up 11 sacks this year, and they've been very successful running the ball. But I, I will say... The, the players around the line have helped them. Leary evading pressure and getting rid of the ball is one of the reasons that the sack total hasn't been worse. Mm-hmm. And we see Kentucky and Missouri have gotten home and, got, and gotten sacks and caused problems in the backfield the last two weeks. Uh, and Ray Davis, if you just look at PFF, for instance, I know a lot of people aren't huge fans of it, but um, Ray Davis has been credited with a lot of the success on the ground, just his hard cut, start, stop, ability, vision, patience. The line has been an upgrade, but yeah, you'd have to give an advantage to Tennessee in terms of the pass rush based on how things have gone recently. Kentucky's had some really good backs in their day. Earlier, you mentioned Benny Snell, Chris Rodriguez, guys like Boom Williams. Where does Ray Davis stack up? I know it's early, but where does he stack up with some of those great Kentucky running backs that have played under Mark Stoops? It's crazy. I mean, I would probably rank him ahead of those guys. And his numbers for his career are not going to are not going to approach that. Um, but he's really a different player than we thought they'd be getting out of Vanderbilt. And against Vanderbilt, you had some really smart SEC media guys saying coming into this year that Ray Davis's success at Vanderbilt was mostly because of opportunity. He just got a lot of carries. 
But when you watch him this year, he's like one of the most explosive players in the country. We just didn't see that quite the same way at Vanderbilt. Um, and, and the fact that he can line up anywhere on the field in the slot out wide, he's got five receiving touchdowns this year. He's got eight rushing touchdowns. He's one of the top big play, chunk play, explosive play guys in the country. Yeah, I mean, we thought coming into the year it would be like, how do they find a way to get Barry on Brown the ball in open space? And it's really been just get Ray Davis the ball mm -hmm. in open space. So he's been different than we expected, uh, but he needs a lot of help. It's been mostly Ray on offense for him this year. Now, that's been a lot of the talk uh, around the kind of when we ask the coaches things about Kentucky, it's a lot of how, how do you stop Ray Davis? And you can kind of tell the look on Hypel's face, the look we talked to Brian Jean Marie, the linebackers coach. They're like, I mean, we're, I mean, we're going to try our best, but you're not going to fully stop him yeah. uh, essentially. And, and I thought it was interesting too. Uh, coach BJ, the linebacker coach said as well that like going back to Vanderbilt, we thought he was one of the premier SEC running backs. And, and so we're not really surprised that he's taken off as he has at Kentucky, but they're going to have their hands full. Tennessee's been a really good run defense, but it's it's a whole nother level when you're playing a running back at this level. At wide receiver, though, who are some of those, or even tight end, who are some of those playmakers that when Leary does air the ball out that he's kind of gotten comfortable targeting? Um, Tavion Robinson, Dane Key, and Barry on Brown are the top three receivers, but they've all been very up and down. Tavion is the senior. He's the most experienced player. He's probably been the most consistent uh, player for them this year, but Barry on is an elite straight line explosive runner, but he's not an elite uh, route runner. He's not elite at getting open at getting separation. And that's his issue. How does he make an impact on the game if he's not an elite route runner? Uh, and so you see them try to get the ball to him on jet sweeps and end arounds and screen passes to limited success. Dane has struggled with drops, but it does seem like he's gotten back on track a little bit and played a little bit more sound the past couple of games. But but yeah, it's it's a group that coming into the season, you look at them and it's like, wow, these are really talented players, but they haven't taken a huge step forward. I think one of the issues is they lost pretty much all of their second string receivers to the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. And these are young guys that are talented, but they don't have anybody pushing them in practice and they haven't had the threat of losing playing time. And so you, I think it's human nature when there's not that everyday competition. It's just not pushing you quite as much. Last question on the offensive end that I have for you, Devin Leary. I'm curious, how has he done when he's faced pressure, when that pocket's collapsed? Ha has he made smart decisions? Has he kind of struggled in those moments? Just what has his operation looked like when he's facing pressure? He's extremely calm in the pocket. One of the things that's jumped out to me about, about Leary is, there have been two times, three times this year when a defender has basically been like rolled over laying on his feet in the mm -hmm. pocket, and he just looks completely unfazed by it. It's almost like the guy is a ghost. He's not even there. Um, so he's very calm and collected, very mature and poised in the pocket, very good at getting rid of the ball, sensing where the pressure is coming from and, and, and getting the ball out. But he hasn't made big plays or, or a lot of things happen with the, when the pressure has come in the backfield. So he is good at keeping his eyes downfield and keeping eligible receivers alive. Uh, and he saved them a lot of lost sack yardage, but some of his worst throws, some of his most errant throws have come after he's maybe had to sidestep or shuffle beside a defender and then reset himself. So the pressure has affected him, but he's comfortable in dealing with it. All right, let's talk a little bit of defense. Last two times Tennessee has played Kentucky, the two games under Hypo, they have reached the 44-point mark, at least 45, and then 44 points. Obviously not the same Tennessee offense this year, not, not the same kind of explosive put up 40 to 50 points a game offense, but how do you think Kentucky's going to play on that end? Do you think that Tennessee is going to hit that 40-point mark, or do you think it'll be one of those more low-scoring uh, type of Tennessee-Kentucky games? I think it'll be a little lower scoring. I mean, I think it's I think it's going to be an ugly game. I don't have a lot of confidence that either Milton or Leary are going to play especially clean. I think Brad White, Kentucky's defensive coordinator, um, give him two weeks to prepare. He's going to have a good game plan in Lexington. Tennessee's 0-2 on the road. Kentucky, how they're going to handle the pressure that's going to be coming, I don't. 
I just don't think it's going to be consistent success for either team on offense. And they both stop their run pretty well. So they know what they have to prepare for. Um, I, th- I think um, t- Tennessee has a chance to establish the run. Um, Kentucky's had a good rush defense this year, but it's not an overpowering rush. It it's not like they tackle you or hit you at the at the line of scrimmage like Alabama or Georgia. I think Tennessee probably will break 150 yards on the ground. Uh, Kentucky's pass defense has been a real problem for the last two games against Georgia and Missouri. They didn't match up well against those receivers, and and I don't think Tennessee's receivers on paper are going to scare them a ton this year, certainly not compared to last year. But I do think there's a chance for Tennessee to come in and run the ball with some effectiveness. I don't think they're going to run all over them, but I don't think Kentucky's going to just shut down the run game either. What is the strength of this Kentucky defense? If you had to pinpoint one thing, what is this defense best at? They've got two individually extremely talented players in Deion Walker on the defensive line and Trevin Wallace at linebacker. There's, those guys could both be top 10 picks over the next two years. And that's not an exaggeration. I mean, Walker is 6'6", 6'7", 350 pounds, and he can drop back in coverage in the middle of the field um, to at least get his arms up. And he, he's very disruptive interior, moving around as, a, as an interior pass rusher, long wingspan, gets in the passing lanes, and he's constantly drawing a double team. Uh, and Trevin Wallace playing right behind him gets from his linebacker position in that base three, four defense to the quarterback as fast as any linebacker in the country. And they really missed him against Missouri. So Trevin Wallace, uh, uh, Deion Walker, and even Maxwell Hairston has been one of the best playmakers in the secondary in the country. He's got, I think five interceptions. He's got, I want to say two or three uh, pick sixes returned for touchdowns. So they have some very explosive players who can peel off, peel off in scheme and go make a play. Uh, but that that's the good. There is some bad if you want me to get into that as well. Yeah, sure. Well, what is yeah. the issues that this defense presents? The safeties haven't played well. We thought that would be a strength coming into the season, but the safeties have not played especially well. They've they've dived at guys' feet. They've, they've missed some assignments. They've been slow in help at times. Um, the corners have been picked on the last two weeks against some very talented receivers for Georgia and Missouri, granted. Um, but I, I feel like they just have – they haven't been great in coverage against Georgia and Missouri. They've just consistently lost one-on-ones. They haven't made great contested plays on the ball, and the safeties have been out of position. So if Tennessee's passing game is clicking, if, if, if Milton puts the ball on point, there is a chance for them to make some big plays. Kentucky's normally good at taking away explosive plays on defense, and they haven't been as good at, at, at that recently. All right, last thing I have to ask for you. You don't have to give an exact score if you don't want to, but how do you see this one playing out? Who do you see winning? Just kind of what are your overall thoughts on what we're going to see this Saturday? I think Tennessee is a better team than Kentucky, but the game is in Lexington, so I understand the line, and I'll stick right with the line. I think Tennessee – I would probably pick Tennessee 27-24. Um, I think it's going to be close. I think the crowd is going to be energized. I think Ray Davis is going to probably make some big plays happen. Uh, But I I just feel like Tennessee's offense has a better chance to move the ball against Kentucky's defense than Kentucky's offense does against Tennessee. Kentucky's offense has just been too inconsistent, too mistake prone, shot themselves in the foot too many times, and the defense trending the wrong direction. I can't pick Kentucky to win, but I do think it'll be a close one. Justin, thank you so much for hopping on with us. Tell everyone where they can find your work, where they can find you on Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah, Roland Rivals on Twitter, X, whichever you prefer, and then catsillustrated.com. We'd love to to have you guys check out some of our stuff and even interact on the forums if, if you're nice. Awesome. Me and Thanks. Noah will be making the trip up to Kentucky this weekend, so we'll see you there. I'll say what's up. But thank you so much for hopping on today. Everyone, make sure you head to VolReport.com as well. Links to everything you need is in the description. And thank you for watching.